everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Verses. This time I'm going to be comparing two capital class ships. The two ships in question that I'm going to be going over are the Kraken, which was created by Drake Interplanetary, and the Idris, which was designed and manufactured by Aegis Dynamics. The Idris has been used as the measuring stick to compare the Kraken to ever since the Kraken was first announced, and both of them are very similar with regards to the roles that they play within the current lineup of capital class vessels. But there is one very significant difference between them, and it's that the Kraken was created specifically for the civilian market, while the Idris was first developed for the UEE military. Although there is a variation on this ship called the Idris P, which is a stripped down version that was specifically sold to civilians, and I'll be talking more about that later on in this video. I'm going to be going over the major differences that exist between the Kraken and the Idris with regards to what kinds of weapons that they're armed with, their capacity to store additional ships, what their components loadouts are, cargo capacity, and in how their intended roles are going to play out within the game. And in the end I'm going to do a side by side comparison of them, and then finish things off with a brief summary. I'm going to start this comparison off by taking a look at the Kraken. The Kraken represents the most ambitious project that's ever been undertaken by Drake Interplanetary, and it currently stands as the flagship to their fleet of vessels. The idea of the Kraken was first introduced during the You Pick the Next Drake Ship contest, where a variety of ships were presented and voted upon. At the time its description could be summed up by the phrase, Mobile Pirate Base, and it wasn't until later on that it was conceived of as being more of an aircraft carrier in design. The Kraken was originally intended to carry two medium-sized ships within a set of internal hangars. But when they tried to build the rest of the ship around this, it ended up being a very problematic design to work with. And although the two internal hangars are still part of its design, it was later re-envisioned to carry a majority of its ships externally on top of its landing pads like an aircraft carrier does. And the current look of the Kraken ended up evolving out of this concept. For components, the Kraken has four capital class fuel intakes, it has two capital class fuel tanks, power plants, coolers, and shield generators, and it has a single capital class quantum drive, jump module, and a single capital class quantum fuel tank. It also has a large radar and six medium sized computers. The Kraken can only be equipped with civilian and industrial class components, and comes with civilian class C items by default. The Kraken has five manned turrets, one of which is forward facing and comes equipped with a pair of size 8 guns. It has an additional four more turrets that are each equipped with two size 6 guns. It also has four remote turrets that come equipped with two size 5 guns, and it doesn't come stocked with any missiles or any additional utility items. It has onboard accommodations for one to two players per landing pad, the quality of which could be best described as basic, meaning that it'll provide a place to rest, change, and sleep, but little else. The Kraken does not have escape pods, and instead looks at the ships that are parked on its landing pads as being a perfectly good solution to this problem. The internal layout of the ship will provide quite a few choke points that run from the landing pads to any of the major locations that are found within the ship, like the engineering section and the bridge. These choke points will allow the crewmen to set up an organized defense to fight off boarding parties, but other than that there's no built in mechanics or defenses that are specifically designed to deal with shipjackers. The view from the bridge is quite enigmatic, and it provides the perfect vantage point to watch ships from as they land and take off. It also provides an odd contrast to how claustrophobic feeling the rest of the ship is. This is mainly due to the dim lighting and complete lack of any interior windows that you're going to find once you're below deck. The Kraken is classified as a light carrier, and it can hold four small ships and two medium sized ships on its main deck, as well as an additional two more craft within a set of internal hangars. The internal hangars are going to have the ability to repair ships that are docked within it, as well as resupply them with ammunition and fuel. The designers are being very coy about the specifics as to which kinds of ships are going to be able to fit within these hangars, other than to say that if it sits, it fits. Which isn't very descriptive in my opinion, but as we've already seen with the 890 jump, people can get very creative with the hangar space that's been provided. It seems that you're going to be able to get two small ships comfortably inside of them, 
and who knows how many more depending on the types of ships that are being used and how skilled the pilot is at landing. Four external landing pads are located on the main deck that are going to be the equivalent to the small landing pads that are found on Alisar. And each one can individually house a single small craft on it. It's usually being depicted as having a buccaneer sitting on one of these pads to give it a sense of scale to go by. Two medium sized pads are also located on the main deck, which can each carry a single medium sized ship. They've been using the cutlass as a current metric to go by when sizing up what other kinds of ships could also land there. And it's been theorized that instead of having two medium ships, you could have a single large ship land in the space. Every one of the external landing pads will connect to an internal tram system. It's designed to carry cargo directly from any of the ships that have landed on the main deck and into the cargo hold of the Kraken. The Kraken's cargo bay is huge, and it's been split up into four sections that when combined can carry a total of 3,792 SUs worth of cargo. This section of the ship can also be accessed through a ramp that's found in the bottom of the cargo bay. One of the more unique aspects of this ship is the bay that's been specifically dedicated to housing a number of dragonflies. This room has a hatch located in the ceiling where the vehicles can drop into and be released from. They've even created a mechanism for it that rotates the dragonflies around for you, so that they're positioned correctly and ready to fly out of the bay when you need them. This is something that I've been hoping to see more of from the other manufacturers, which is to create an inherent level of synergy between ships that have been made by the same company. And I'm talking about something that goes beyond just having two ships fighting styles complementing each other, and more along the lines with the level of interaction that the Dragonfly Bay presents. It's interesting to see that Drake ended up being the first company to act as an example for this, and I hope to see more things like this in the future from the other ship manufacturers. The Kraken has the ability to land on the surface of a planet, which is a confirmed feature of this ship. And being able to do this adds so much more to the amount of versatility that it has. So it can not only act as a mobile base for space adventures, but for planetary expeditions as well. Its ability to perform within an atmosphere is being described as poor at best, but it does have multiple VTOL thrusters that are going to allow it to take off and land. Two of which are located under the front stabilizers of the ship, both of which can pivot down at a 90 degree angle, and more of them are built into the underside of the rear hull that are set into a permanently downward facing position. This ship has very unjustly been referred to as having paper-thin survivability. It's true that Drake ships aren't known for their inherent hull strength, or for having thick armor. But when it comes down to it, each ship has three layers of protection, which are its shield strength, its armor thickness, and its hull integrity. The hull integrity of a ship could be more aptly looked at as its hit points. Regardless of how it's being described in the flavor text, capital class ship that's the size of something like the Kraken is going to have enough hit points so that it's not going to be easily taken out. Even if you could penetrate through its shields, it's going to require a lot of firepower to chip away at the Kraken's hull to the point where it's going to cause any significant amounts of damage. And it's going to require a wing of bombers to inflict the amount of punishment that's going to be needed to punch through its shields. It should be noted that the Kraken shields are only going to cover the hull of the ship and are not going to extend to cover any of the craft that are parked on its landing pads, or even people who are walking along the outer deck of the ship. Ships that are parked on the external landing pads are going to have to rely on their own shields to protect them. And it's recommended for pilots to cut the engines, but to keep their power turned on, and the shields fully powered up after they've landed. But any ships that are parked within the internal hangars will be protected by the Kraken shields. So remember that if you have a favorite ship that you're planning on bringing along with you. They're also going to be adding in threshold levels of damage for shields, which means that any damage that's being done to a shield which doesn't exceed a certain amount will be completely ignored by it. The Kraken's two capital class shields are going to be nigh invulnerable to almost anything other than a squadron of bombers or another capital class vessel. And having this level of protection shouldn't be considered as paper thin by any stretch of the imagination. Drake Interplanetary isn't officially connected to any known criminal organizations. Although at this point, you'd have to be rather blind not to notice that a full lineup of Drake ships creates the quintessential pirate fleet, with the Kraken acting as their operational center and flagship. 
But beyond that, I can see a lot of uses for this ship, both lawful and unlawful alike. Which includes it being able to act as the perfect way station for a convoy of ships. Think of it as a mini Alisar for an armada, where any incoming vessels can land on the Kraken, and from there take a dragonfly to transport over to any of the other ships within the armada. This way you can venture out to a convoy from any port, and not have to worry about what to do with your ship once you've gotten there. The Kraken can also provide a substantial amount of firepower to help protect a group of ships, and could personally oversee running an entire wing of fighter craft that could actively patrol the surrounding area. Another highly functional use for the Kraken could be to act as a top-tier escort ship. And I mean for something like a fleet of Orions or Reclaimers that are planning on going deep into uncharted or dangerous territories. I've already heard a number of tactics from people about how they plan on getting around some of the current limitations that an escort fighter is going to have keeping up with a traveling armada of ships. Remember that even a medium-sized escort ship is going to have to make frequent stops during a long QT jump and you're only going to be able to travel as fast as the slowest member of your group. Also, during quantum travel, bigger ships are going to travel faster than smaller craft will. A capital ship can jump at nearly double the speed of a vessel that's been outfitted with a size 1 quantum drive. So even if you do have a wing of defenders with you, they're always going to be trailing behind while you're quantum jumping. And the longer you travel for, the more they're going to fall behind. This could be a problem if you get prematurely pulled out of quantum where it's going to take some time before the escort fighters are going to be able to catch up with you and provide you with any help. A lot of the ideas to work around these problems have been quite imaginative, and a good portion of them involves setting up different groups of escorts to meet up with you at key points during your journey. But you're not always going to be afforded this luxury, especially if you're planning on traveling well past the borders of the known shipping lanes. There's also going to be hazards along the way which are going to pull you out of quantum, and you're not going to want to be left unguarded if that ends up happening. This means that you're going to need to have ships with you that can not only provide proper protection, but also be able to keep up with the rest of the armada as well. And having support and protective craft with you for every step of the journey is going to be paramount. The Kraken can not only provide all the support you're going to need in terms of the ships that it carries with it, but can also continue to operate for as long as you needed, and could keep up with the rest of the fleet no matter how far the quantum leap is, or how long you're planning on staying out in deep space for. The Kraken is also going to provide the perfect base of operations to launch a group of utility craft from, like say for instance a fleet of prospectors or vultures. You could have the Kraken take position in a central location, and then send out the swarm to go looking for materials to harvest. Or it could go planet side, and be used as a base to send out a series of ground parties from, to head out and explore, set up a base camp, or do pretty much anything else that needs to be done. When it comes right down to it, the Kraken may not be as battle ready as something like the Idris, but its ability to carry up to 8 ships is going to provide it with a huge amount of utility. It opens up a large number of possibilities as to what this ship could be used for, especially when it comes to commercial based endeavors. It also has a lot higher capacity to carry cargo, and is going to be tough enough to provide protection for even a large group of ships. The Idris is the third largest ship in the UEE Navy, next to the Javelin and the Bengal Carrier. It's also going to play a major part in Squadron 42, so you know a lot of work is going to be put into this ship. The Idris is classified as a frigate, which is described as being larger than a bomber, but smaller than a ship of the line, which means that it's going to be more maneuverable when compared to the other larger capital ships. The Idris was named after the Battle of Idris IV, as both a way to commemorate the system's sacrifice during the First Tavarn War, and as a way to personally gain favor with the UEE's prime citizen, who at the time was Ivan Messer. This planet was also the original manufacturing site for Aegis's line of capital ships, which started with the construction of the Idris frigate. Ivan Messer personally gave a famous yet disturbing speech at the inaugural launch of the Idris. The ending statement to his speech was, Never again can we let humanity be made the victim. Let all who would dare become the enemy of the Empire tremble as they hear of our victories in Idris, and the ship that bears its name. 
As I stated in the beginning of this video, there are two variations on the Idris, which are designated as the Idris M and the Idris P. The Idris M is the military variant out of the two. The main distinguishing characteristic that sets them apart is a huge rail cannon that's mounted onto the front of this ship. It's a size 10 weapon, and so far it puts anything else to shame in terms of range and damage. It also adds an extra 9 meters onto the overall length of the ship. It has two remote turrets that are armed with a pair of size 4 guns each. It has one man turret that has a pair of size 7 guns, and five additional man turrets that each have a pair of size 5 guns mounted onto them. It also holds a complement of 10 size 5 missiles, and its cargo capacity is 831. The Idris P is the Mark II Peacekeeper variant of the Idris Frigate. It was originally developed for the UEE patrol services and is now available for civilians to purchase. The Idris P strips the standard ship-to-ship -ship guns and spinal mount in favor of additional cargo capacity and superior speed. That means it no longer has the rail cannon, but it still has the space to have a rail cannon mounted onto it after the fact if you can acquire one in-game. It comes stock with four remote turrets that are armed with a pair of size 4 guns each, and six man turrets that have a pair of size 5 guns mounted onto them. It's listed as having a cargo capacity of 995 SCUs. Both varieties of the Idris have the same list of components, which includes a single capital class fuel tank, quantum drive, jump module, and a single quantum fuel tank. They have two capital class fuel intakes and power plants, six medium sized computers, and a large radar. The Idris also has two capital class and six medium sized coolers, as well as two capital class and twelve medium sized shield generators. The maximum crew for the Idris is listed as being 28 people, while the number of crewmen who are going to appear in the Idris for Squadron 42 is at last count 81 people including the player. This may seem like a huge hike in the existing population, but considering that there could be as many as 12 people stationed on the bridge at any given time, you can start to see how this number began to rise as the game continued to be worked on. And the final increase in the number of crewmen came after they found that they needed to have two shifts of people to run the ship one of which would be manning the available stations, while the other group slept, ate, and took time off to recreate. This essentially doubled the number of people who were needed to be stationed on board. There's very little negative space found within this ship, and every square inch of it has ended up being accounted for. The amount of unused space that exists within a vessel has been a major complaint among the early ship designs in the past. And the Idris, both through necessity and learning from past mistakes, has become one of the best examples of a ship that utilizes its space to its fullest. A large portion of the interior section of the Idris has been set aside as a hangar that can comfortably house three small ships within it. Bay doors are set in both the front and rear of the hangar that can open up to allow ships to enter from one side and then exit from the other. This creates a realistic aircraft carrier experience in the way that ships land and take off from the Idris. Surprisingly, it's even more reminiscent of how a traditional aircraft carrier works than you'd find with the Kraken, which, ironically, looks far more like an aircraft carrier, yet somehow doesn't seem to provide that same experience in the way its ships take off and land. Due to the efforts of Squadron 42, we currently know a lot about the physical makeup of the Idris. This includes specifics about the ship's layout and where various stations are going to be located within it. The Idris is going to come with every type of facility that the game has to offer, and then some. This includes a large mess hall, a fully operational med bay, an engineering section, a missile room, multiple bathrooms, a control room, a briefing room, lots of escape pods, sleeping quarters, a standalone hangar for the Argo, captain's quarters, cargo bay, shooting range, armory, ready room, the bridge, and of course a huge fully enclosed hangar bay. The Idris has been used for everything from long duration patrols to scouting dangerous jump points. It's often used to protect a sector or provide rescue and disaster relief, and does regular perimeter sweeps along the borders of UEE and alien occupied space. The ship is designed to be self-sufficient. It can provide support for any ships that find themselves in need, and is able to take on even capital class threats. There are plans to start developing missions that are specifically tailored for larger ships like the Hammerhead and even the Idris. 
So although the operational cost of this ship will represent a substantial drain on an org's funds, it'll still be able to be used to earn UEC, which should, at least to some capacity, help to sustain itself and subsidize its operational fees. Plus, it's a lot more fun to do missions than it is to sit around waiting for trouble to find you. And let's face it, not too many people are going to stick around to fight an Idris. One of the main appeals for this ship is that it can act as a mobile base for whatever you're planning on doing. For instance, the Idris may be expensive to operate and maintain, but it can still transport you, several ships you're choosing, and an entire crew's worth of people to anywhere you wish, both within sectors or out into uncharted space. It can fly out to the deepest depths of the unknown, or remarkably for a ship of its size, is also able to land planetside. Its ability to land on a planet mainly comes from its huge VTOL thrusters, that are powerful enough even to let a ship of the Idris' size hover in place while you look for an LZ that's big enough to land on. The Idris is a military vessel that's specifically meant for battle, which means that it's going to be ideal in providing support for any combat-based operations. It's faster than the other large capital vessels, and was designed to hold the line and fight right alongside the Javelin and the Bengal carrier in times of war. When compared to the Kraken, the Idris has better armor, better shielding, and its default components are of a higher grade. The Idris can carry fewer ships, but it stores them internally, which is going to provide them with a lot more protection. And it has a railgun. That is if you're lucky enough to get an Idris M or an upgrade kit that allows you to transform your Idris P to an M. Or just happen to acquire a rail cannon in-game somehow. If that happens, then you're going to have a size 10 long-range sniper rifle mounted onto the front of your ship. And there's nothing like having the ability to destroy your target before they even have the chance to respond. When it comes to components, the Idris has 6 more medium-sized coolers and 12 more medium-sized shield generators than the Kraken. That's the equivalent to having 2 more large coolers and an extra capital class shield. It also has 4 capital class fuel intakes, while the Kraken only has 2. But the Kraken does have 2 capital class fuel tanks, while the Idris only has 1. Aegis Ships also provides for all the needs of their crew that goes well beyond the basics, and it spares no expense when it comes to crew survivability. Escape pods are going to be located on every deck, and near every major station that's found within the ship. In general, the interior of Aegis' ships tend to have a lot less of a militaristic look to it, especially when you compare them to other military contractors like Anvil, for example. It's a lot better lit, and it has windows that are built into and in between the walls. This can help to open the space up, at least on a visual level, to make the surrounding area seem like it's a lot less confined. And it makes it feel a lot less oppressive when you're walking around inside of it. Little elements like this start to matter more when you have to spend a majority of your time below deck and on board the ship for an extended stay. Even the rounded hallways of the Idris adds to the illusion of open space that the ship inherently has. And even more so when compared to the narrow, square-shaped corridors of the Kraken. Like with most things, taste is in the eye of the beholder, and the submarine-like confinement and unrefined look of the Drake aesthetic is exactly what some people like about it. So the look of either ship isn't inherently better or worse than the other, and ends up being more of a matter of what your personal preference tends to lean towards. A good portion of the Kraken's interior is going to come from the same kit that most of the Caterpillar comes from. And outside of some of its more unique locations like the engine room, Dragonfly Bay, and the unique looking bridge, the rest of its interior is going to be very reminiscent of what you're going to find within the Caterpillar. While most of the interior from the Hammerhead comes from the same kit that's being used to construct the Idris with, so you can use that ship as a good idea what a majority of the Idris's basic layout is going to look like. The method used for landing ships on the Kraken is a lot more intelligently laid out and considerably more convenient than it is for the Idris, where each ship can independently come and go without being hindered by the other vessels. It doesn't matter if the Kraken is nearly empty or fully loaded with additional ships, and no matter which pad you've landed on, you can always just strafe up and right off the ship's deck in order to get going. Even the internal hangars are subdivided from one another and can be independently accessed. While the Idris parks its ships one in front of the other, so that the one in the middle will be stuck there until either the ship in front of it or the one behind it leaves first. And there's not going to be enough room in the hangar to lift off and fly over the ship that's blocking you. 
The same goes for landing, where the first ship to enter the hangar is going to have to remember to park in the spot that's located furthermost in the front. Otherwise, the other two ships aren't going to have enough room to land, or may have to enter from the other direction and land facing opposite of the other ships in the hangar, which is going to present its own set of problems later on. This situation could end up being a veritable nightmare of parking mishaps if the pilots don't know what they're doing when it comes to landing, or if you need to take out a specific ship that's being blocked by the others. The Idris and the Kraken are going to be among the largest ships that can still land on the surface of a planet, while still retaining the ability to take off again and get back into orbit on their own. This is going to make them both ideal candidates for being used as a base after you've landed on a planet. Although the Kraken seems to be a lot better suited for sending out ships to scout around and do missions with. Whereas the Idris seems like it's going to be better equipped for deploying ground forces. That's because the Idris provides a very convenient way to send out ground troops and vehicles, having a huge ramp that extends directly out from the front of the hangar bay. It's big enough to handle deploying any type of ground vehicle that the game has to offer. And although its interior hangar is only rated for three ships, the amount of cubic space that it provides is going to be capable of transporting a rather large number of ground forces. And I can't wait to see an Idris's worth of vehicles charging out of it and down that gangway all at once. When it comes to storing vehicles, the Kraken presents some interesting problems that can be solved using some creative methods as a workaround. For instance, the only way to get vehicles in and out of the Kraken is going to be through the cargo bay elevator which is going to behave a lot like how the Connie's cargo bay works, by descending down from the belly of the ship. But the Kraken's cargo bay is divided up into sections, and it's unclear at this time as to how much space is going to be made available around the ramp that you could use to store vehicles on, or if the cargo grid is even going to be able to support locking down a vehicle on it. Plus, vehicles take up a lot of cargo space. It'd be much more convenient to transport vehicles on the top deck of the Kraken, and you could store a huge amount of vehicles on its top deck. Trouble is, how do you get them down once you've landed on a planet? The best solution to this would be to have an Argo SRV or a Cutlass Black use their tractor beam to pick vehicles off the deck and put them down on the planet's surface. This could prove to be a bit tedious, but it could still work. And when it comes to capital class versus capital class ship battles, the Kraken is not going to be able to withstand the same amount of punishment from heavy weapons as the Idris would. Thanks to its lack of armor, the Kraken is not going to have the capacity to mitigate any of the damage that does end up bleeding through its shields. This is going to put it at a disadvantage during a large-scale battle, or if you plan on going up against another capital-class ship. All this means, though, is that you're going to have to alter your tactics when fighting against a larger vessel, and to properly use the ships that it has on board to the Kraken's advantage. In the end, it's easy to dismiss the Kraken in a head-to-head -head battle against an Idris especially if it's facing off against an Idris M that has the rail cannon, thicker armor, heavier shields, and missiles for it to contend with. While the Idris P is going to be more of an even matchup, having its missile firing capacity, rail cannon, and some of the turrets stripped from it. And it's going to be a more common version of this ship to end up coming across. But still, it's going to have enough firepower to hold its own, and its heavier armor and thicker shields is going to allow it to take a lot more damage. It may not have as much hangar space as the Kraken, but it can still send out up to three bombers of its own, like a trio of gladiators or eclipses, which is going to be enough to deliver a fatal amount of damage to a ship like the Kraken. At least it will be if they can manage to reach their target. An actual fight between a Kraken and an Idris would be a sight to behold, with the Kraken most likely holding back and sending off its fleet of up to eight bombers out ahead of it, as the Idris sends out its own ships to intercept them while using their turrets as an anti-ship and torpedo point defense system. There's going to be no guarantees in a situation like this, but it's going to be really fun to see how it plays out. Now that's going to be it for this edition of Versus. I'd like to thank everybody for liking and subscribing to the channel. It really helps me out and allows for the channel to grow. And I'd like to give a big thanks to my backers for their continued support. If you'd like to become a backer, then you can find a link to my Patreon channel in the description of this video. Thanks again for watching, and take care.